Okay, maybe I'll, I'll move here. Uh, good uh, afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, very glad to see so many of you here. Uh, uh, my name is Erki Oja, from I'm an emeritus professor from the Department of Computer Science at Aalto University, Finland. Uh, and as, as Tony, Tony said, I've been in this field for about 40, 40 years or more. G got my PhD actually just, just 40 years ago in 1977. Um, but I'm not going to talk about my research today, because I was asked to present some kind of lightweight overview of of some technologies uh, that are very, very hot, very hot today. So uh, the contents of the talk are basically very short answers to these questions: What are what is artificial intelligence? What are neural networks? What is deep learning? What is machine learning? And where are we now? Well, we know where we are, but why are we here? Why are so many people here in this room? The reason is uh, is perhaps shown by this Gardner's hype curve. I'm sure many of you know, know these hype curves that they publish every year. This is the latest one from July 2016. And uh, uh, you probably cannot read, especially at the back of this small text, but let me read some of these things that are kind of climbing up to the height of the, of the hype hill. There's something like general purpose machine intelligence. Machine intelligence is a synonym for artificial intelligence. So that's that's exactly our, our what we are talking about here. There's something called neuromorphic hardware, making hardware that emulates the brain. There's something called uh, um, personal analytics, uh, conversational user interfaces, brain-computer interface, virtual personal assistants. Uh, we, we, we go up, up, uh, gesture control devices, smart robots. And here, at the very peak, is something called machine learning. So now, now is the good time to talk about talk about this topic that is very, very close to my heart. Then, uh, then it goes to more and more practical application. You never know what comes out of these techniques that are very strongly hyped, but uh, many of them, of course, become real technology commercial uh, that can be commercialized and, and used. So my fir first question is, what is artificial intelligence? Sounds kind of a fancy, fancy word. Um, this, this is a field that has been around for something like 60, no, seven, 60 years. And one of the pioneers, Professor John McCarthy, defined it as the science and engineering of making intelligent machines, especially intelligent computer programs. So ha they don't have to be kind of walking robots, they can be just software hidden in a, in, a, in a computer. It is related to the task of using computers to understand human intelligence but AI does not have to confine itself to biologically observable methods. Note there, there are kind of two things here. One is that basically the, the ultimate way to build artificial intelligence would be to understand how human brain works, how human intelligence works, human brain and mind. If we knew that, then, then of course we could put it into a machine and get much more powerful intelligence uh, by, by that way. But we don't know how the brain and mind work. Only, only very small ones things there, and so the 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 task that remains is to try to just uh, think of ways to make machines look intelligent, even if they behave in a or, th or their inner workings are very different from 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 how the brain brain does it. But please remember this kind of biological intelligence versus versus uh, totally artificial intelligence. Uh, at first, uh, the the basis for artificial intelligence was logic called mathematical logic. So it was based on logic rules, search, game playing, reasoning, theorem proving, automatically proving theorems and so on. And there were some influential uh, computer languages, especially called Lisp and Prolog. This, uh, this it's impossible for you to see that, but Prolog is, is a very nice uh, kind of uh, declarative language that, uh, that has uh, certain facts buried in the code, like here, likes Garth language. It, is, it should be interpreted as Garth likes language. And then there are some rules like, uh, like um, trendy, trendy language uh, L if likes Garth language. So uh, a, a language is trendy if Garth likes the language. So very simple facts and rules. So Prolog is based on that. And then there's an inference engine 
that can uh, uh, answer queries made by made by the user. And uh, this is this is a very influential model. And the success story, big success story after that, were the expert systems. I don't know if there is any anybody here of that age that would remember the expert systems in in the uh, early 80s. Uh, and the big idea in expert systems was that uh, instead of burying everything in this in this programming code, all the facts and the rules, you put them in a separate knowledge base. Facts about anything like diseases or uh, geology, what whatever. Facts and rules. And then you have a kind of generic inference engine that can take any knowledge base, whatever is the application, and also always derive re re reason, do d reasoning and derive some new, new things up, uh, out of that. And so the user makes a query and, uh, and gets, gets uh, answers. But uh, in, in those days, uh, this knowledge base had no, no automatic learning. So what, what was done was to take a knowledge expert and then he or she put these facts and rules into the knowledge base from, from his, his or her own, own head, because he or she knew the, knew the stuff. Now more recent developments, I'm going very quickly because I have uh, 30 minutes. Uh, recent highlights have been game playing hardware especially, and, and software. This you may remember, uh, IBM's Deep Blue, that just 20 years ago in May 1997, one Gary Kasparov, who was then the reigning world champion in chess, and now it's it's a completely uh, common that uh, that a computer program will win a human a chess player, no matter how good this human is. And just uh, one or two weeks ago, uh, Google's AlphaGo software won uh, the re kind of reigning champion Kechie in Go. It was believed that Go. It's a kind of board game which is so hard uh, for for a machine and so uh, kind of uh, not easy for a human being, but kind of easy for our intuitive understanding that uh, it w it will be impossible to to invent a computer program that would beat the best human Go players. But now it's happened, and uh, and I'm sure this this Go playing uh, software will will be will will become even even stronger in the future. Today. The most influ influential traditional AI systems are what is called question answering systems. You want to know something, you go to a computer and ask, and then you get the answer. That's, that's nice. That's, that's, that's the, the idea. But now the difference to these expert systems that also had these queries and answers is that uh, instead of this expert design knowledge base, they learn by simply reading books and and uh, whatever web pages whatever they can really read read uh, in a, an enormous amount of material in a very short time and then take some uh, snippets of uh, facts and and rules and things from from the text free free language like natural language text and and of course uh, quite heavy natural language technologies are needed in order to extract something useful that a machine can understand let's say from a from a story shakespeare play or something like that uh, the most famous AI today is called uh, IBM Watson, developed by, by IBM, and it has an enormous knowledge base here that has been collected offline. Uh, it has typically read uh, hundreds of millions of pages of text, books, and uh, all, all, the, all the Wikipedia, uh, large, large uh, parts of the internet are there, and then trying to find some kind of what, what they call text nuggets out of all that text that talks about some things and then then storing them in this in these knowledge databases now when a question comes in a, a person asks a question then there's some kind of a changing of this human question into a kind of you know way machine readable form and then what happens is that looking at this uh, enormous uh, basically knowledge graph that has lots of things that co that are connected uh, this system tries to find somewhere in this enormous graph a place where this topic is uh, discussed that the user is interested in, that has the same words or some, something like that. And then uh, generating, uh, let's say, uh, some hundreds of possible answers, which are then tested and, and ranked, and finally, finally out, comes the, out comes the answer. Uh, 
thi this will will be a, an even bigger thing in the future. So now it has been used for some funny funny chopardy games and uh, and so. But uh, now they are already routinely using it for uh, for medicine and uh, maybe for legal legal ad ad advising. And this is this is the future of of this question question answering systems. Uh, then neural networks have been mentioned here. Uh, from late, you remember I, I said that this artificial intelligence can be built in two ways: either just just by doing it using logic and so on, mathematics, or by trying to trying to see how humans and animals are are behaving. How what what is the our human intelligence? What is cat intelligence? What is dog intelligence? And so there was a new trend in AI called connectionism or neural neural computation, trying to emulate some neural circuits in the brain. But uh, this was not not really welcomed by these traditional true AI people. They they hated it. They they said that this is this is nonsense and it, it will lead to no lead nowhere. I remember this because I was I was there on this weaker side at that time. So true AI, remember it was symbolic, expert system search, logic frame, semantic nets, Lisp, Prolog. Here, some gradients, for instance, derivatives, numerical things, which should never be there in, in pure AI, because it was zero one, you know, logic. Oh. Uh, but uh, then uh, somehow this, this, this thing things came together in late 1980s, and especially probabilistic, what is called Bayesian reasoning, neural networks slo slowly sneaked into this AI. And today, learning is an integral part of AI systems. For instance, in IBM Watson, they are heavily using, using a technique called deep learning. To to collect their databases, but what are these neural networks? Um, this is the kind of very classical, traditional neural network. You have uh, neurons, which are these the circles. You have inputs and you have outputs. And actually, what this what this whole whole machine is doing is simply computing a function. So this output y, output y is a function of all these inputs. I use boldface here. This is the only equation I think I have in the in the whole talk. This boldface x means the collection of these inputs x1, x2, x3, and x, x4. And theta is an is a set of parameters which basically are the connection strengths between these neurons. And they are changing in these learning learning rules. E, e is an error because because you can never and you should not compute compute a, a Completely uh, error, uh, errorless, errorless um, result for the reason that I'm showing. Uh, a regression. Probably many of you fall asleep when you hear the word regression, regression function. But you remember from some first year university studies that what it means is that you have a set of points and then you fit some kind of line through the points. That's regression. Now let's imagine that, that you have a table. It's called a training set training table that has two columns, x column and y column, and it has lots of, lots of numbers here. And you want to find what is the relation between x and y, so that when you input on x, you get out the corresponding y. Um, of course, if you input one of these x's in the table, then you can read from the table what is the value for, for, for y. But let's say that you, you input an x that is here between. What is the value of y in the at this point? Where, where is it? And that, that's, that's why regression is so useful. Then you can find a value of y for any x. So you do it by, by fitting maybe a straight line or a bit more complex curves here. And then, then now, now wh when you ask what is the value of y at this point, x, <laughs> well, it's one of these three. It's, it's a tricky choice, and, but there are many statistical ways how to, how to choose between those. And now this is what the neural network is simply doing. Even a deep learning neural network is simply doing. The only difference is that this x is not one-dimensional, but there are many, many, many inputs. And also the output is not one-dimensional, there are many, many, many outputs. Uh, and, and so this curve, a nonlinear curve, is, an, is no more a curve, it's a surface, it's a nonlinear hypersurface. If you can visualize a thousand-dimensional space, then this is easy for you, but I cannot. And I've never met anybody who could, so, uh, so we have to kind of visualize this whole thing using this kind of metaphor. 
But this is, this is what the neural network is simply doing. Trying to fit, fit to some kind of surface to this training set that it has. And then from this surface you can read the values of the output for any input. Uh, let me give, an, give another e example. Let's say that you have a time series that you want to predict, like uh, the currency exchange rate between, between euro and dollar, for instance. And, uh, and for, uh, for some reason you, you have reason to, to think that the value at a certain day depends on the four previous values on yesterday and so on and so on. So then, then you build a neural network that has four inputs because you want to be able to input these four previous values into the network and one output because you want to estimate just one value, let's say the value for tomorrow. And then, then you do training by sliding this kind of window through the training set which is the time series for which you know everything, the history of the time series, just to learn how the time series behaves. And you put these four numbers here and this fifth number you put here and then by a training rule called uh, uh, backpropagation algorithm you shake these connections so that, so that they settle into, into such values that these, these four values actually produce this, this fifth value. And, y and you go all through this time series actually several times. And what happens is that finally this um, network learns to predict very well what happens here. But of course the important thing is prediction, the value for tomorrow, right? Because you don't know that. Then of course what you do is just to take these four values today, yesterday and so on, put them in and then you get the value for tomorrow. And ma you make money because now you know the exchange rate for tomorrow. Uh, this is just a typical prediction result. The black curve is, uh, is the it's a true, true time series, and these dots are the are the um, predictions. But remember, they have been made by so that you actually know these four values, and then you only predict the next one. So, so it's kind of one-step prediction. What's the big deal? I mean, I, I said that you probably fall asleep when you hear the regression. What's the big deal? What is, is there any use for this kind of system? Let me imp <laughs> impress you that multivariate regression is immensely useful because it can model any input-output relation. For instance, every computer program ever written is an input-output relation because you put some input data there and it gives you output data. It's an input-output relation. So basically you could you could even, at least in theory, you could uh, approximate every computer program by a neural network. Not, not exactly, but to some extent. Think of credit rating, for instance. Uh, you're a bank manager, and uh, in comes uh, a customer who wants to have a loan from you. And, and you ask him to fill a form that, that to give some vital things like uh, his, his annual income, uh, whether he's married or not, uh, where does he live, uh, does he have his own house or is he, is he rented or whatever, whatever. And then from your previous customers who have filled exactly the same form, and of course you have to now, you have to change this form into numerical values because the neural network only takes in numbers. But there are, there are ways to transform almost any data into just numbers. You can, you can do that, even a, even a document page you can easily easily turn into numbers by, by certain tricks. Okay, but you have these old customers and you know for those customers whether they were able to pay back their loan or not, whether they were zeros or ones. So you have this full training set, you have their, their forms and you have zero, one, zero, zero, one, one here. So, so now you can train your network and now you put in this form of your new customer and your network says well, the probabilities of, of getting your money back is 0.32. No. I'm sorry, maybe you go to the next bank. That's how it goes. Or in a medical diagnosis, uh, you have customers that have certain symptoms, and you know uh, that some of them, for instance, have died, some have not. Now the your, your next, uh, next uh, patient, I'm sorry, patient comes in and, and, and you can put his, his or her symptoms in and then have the probability uh, whether <laughs> he or she will die or not. Um, and especially for, for recognition, speech recognition, character recognition, things like that. But, but remember, all of these networks, these fancy deep networks, they are doing nothing but regression from input to output. 
based on the training set. Trying to guess what is the output for a given input based on, on, this, on this training set. So what is deep learning? Uh, this is the first deep learning neural network, so-called LeNet, by a guy called Jan LeCun, uh, introduced in uh, 19, 1989. And uh, what deep means is simply that you have many of these layers. You see that there's the input, the output, but then there's one, two, three other layers. So it's a kind of um, three hidden layers in, in this. So deep simply means that you have the neural network that has many of these hidden layers. But it's still doing the same thing. It's just computing a slightly more complex function, so it's uh, easier to do regression with this kind of very powerful network compared to this, this one, one layer. For instance, here he was, classi he was classifying uh, uh, handwritten numbers that are written on the 16 by 16 grid. So we have 256 uh, numbers, each a 0 <coughs> or 1. And that is uh, the 256-dimensional input to the network. And there are 10 outputs. Uh, so for instance, in this case, what uh, wh when the network, sac network has been trained, this output that, that has 5 here should give a high number, let's say, all the numbers are between 0 and 1, a high number, let's say, 0 0.9. And all the others should uh, say something like 0 0.1, 0 0.3. And now you know that it's, it's very probably a 5 because, because this, uh, this output unit is, is, is uh, giving that, that uh, strong, strong number. But you see, this is still kind of just a good old regress regression. Uh, actually, we, we had a... Uh, the first uh, international conference on artificial neural networks here in here in in, in, in Espo in 1991, and uh, I propose in that this is my my paper, so-called deep autoencoder, which is a similar kind of three hidden layer network. But uh, the difference here is that you you have you have only you don't have the outputs. You actually have only the inputs. So you put the same input x here, <coughs> inputs x here, and the same inputs x you put here. And then you then you try to shake so that so that x gives x. Well, it sounds like an I extremely easy problem to find a function that gives out the s the, the, s the same that you put in. I mean, how many? Okay, but the trick here is that you have you have this much smaller hidden layer here that uh, kind of compresses your your information into lower dimensions. Uh, okay. Uh, this was quite difficult to train, but uh, it has been continued by several people. Geoffrey Hinton, Yoshio Bencho are the big names in this deep learning business. Nowadays, this is extremely popular because of the power, versatility, efficient software. So, for instance, in image classification, you put an image here, and then you get some class. Could be, for instance, a cat-dog dog, uh, classifier. These networks are huge. The famous ImageNet has 150,000 input units. So here we would have 150,000 of these and 1,000 of these and then, then lots of neurons in, in the middle. Millions of weight parameters. Uh, the way to train it is using graphical, graphical um, processing units. Uh, let me show you, a show you a simple example. We, we repeated this, uh, this test um, And now, now you see this image, and then you see the five most probable labels for this image, uh, out of 1,000 possible labels. So this is not real-time classification, of course. They have been pre-classified, but I, I just show wanted to show show you how this kind of generic image uh, labeling neural network does it. Well, it's endless, so uh, in, in, the, in the original image net, I think they had one million images, so it takes quite a time to... to um, Trackball, joystick, pool ball, plum or buckeye. Who knows? But anyway, especially in, in the social media, 
there are lots, lots and lots of images and videos that don't have this annotation, they don't have the labels. So one needs tools for computerized uh, image annotation. This, that's what this, this thing is, is doing. Okay, let me go back. I still have some some things. Um, let's see, that was deep learning. What is machine learning? Well, it is a set of methodologies to make a machine learn from data. Any kind of a data. Text, uh, speech, videos, images, whatever. And uh, it is a study of learning algorithms to devise powerful algorithms that can learn from data. Neural networks, especially deep learning, they are central tool, but there are many other methodologies. This is just something that uh, in, in, in my lab we used to work with. Um, an, an especially important model class today is, is so-called probabilistic latent variable models, Bayesian models. This is very mathematical. Th th these are not easy, of course, but maybe there are some people here who know, know better than me what, the, what they mean. An example is clustering. For instance, you have some data nodes, let's say n, n items of data, and you want to divide it into certain clusters. Okay, well, I'll skip that. Uh, so, uh, where, where are we now? And uh, this is my, my final slide. Um, um, I'm not good in predicting things any better than anybody else, so I what I did was to take, take this text uh, basically from uh, from this uh, Gartner's we web page. Top 10 strategic technology trends for 2017s of, of all, all existing technology. Uh, and the number one is AI and advanced machine learning. Th they are saying this. So if, if you're doing this, you're in a very good company. So especially deep learning, now you know what it is. Neural networks, you know what that is. Natural language processing, you can guess what that is. And uh, the <laughs> and the tools are especially parallel processing. I mentioned GPUs, for instance, but one can of course also use uh, clusters and, and cloud. Uh, advanced algorithms, I I mentioned that, and of course massive data sets. Because the better uh, better uh, the the better data you have, the better are the results. Then the second one is intelligent apps, meaning kind of software apps, especially these virtual personal assistants. You can ask a question of your phone and it, it will it will answer a security tooling marketing and here uh, you need advanced advanced analytics uh, and conversational interfaces is in interfaces perhaps uh, text interfaces with natural language or perhaps also speech interfaces with with natural language and finally the real uh, intelligent things i mean hardware and and there the topmost ones are robots yeah, perhaps industrial robots or service robots, uh, drones, you know, uh, maybe war warfare, unfortunately, is, is a big driving force here. And intelligent vehicles uh, and, uh, and the, the big Internet of Things that everybody's talking about. But there you also now face some totally non-technical things like liability, privacy, these uh, legal issues. I think my time is up. Thank you for your attention. So, is there any questions about uh, AI? I think we have the person here I who can answer most of the questions. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, of course, first you must have the people. That's, that's, that, that might be might be the bottleneck. But we try to train as many people as as, as we can, high level people in this field. But uh, certainly the demand is the demand is huge. So you really need an expert here because this is not. I mean, there is software, and they say that this is uh, everybody can use this software, but uh, but it's not true. So you have to understand the software, be able to use it. It's it's complicated. But also, um, I made it sound like you just have this data set, and then then you just train. But who gives you the data set, the training data set? That's, that's a huge problem. So getting this data set and uh, doing what is called curation of the data, meaning trying to make it more or less correct, 
that's essential. Because these are definitely these so-called garbage in, garbage out sti systems. If, if, you, if your training data is erroneous, then all the results will be also just bull. So uh, there are this is not an easy technology. One of your questions. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they say that you know the self-improving algorithm is five to ten years away, which means that I mean we get actually an AI which can improve itself. Yeah. But, but that's easy or easier. Uh, I have to ask you the singularity question. <laughs> <laughs> when will it become sentient? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So th everybody, I guess, knows the singularity question that that they become so in intelligent that suddenly they overpass humans. Uh, uh, Self-aware. Uh, I, I don't believe in that. Okay. It, it's so far away. Well, I, I can easily say not during my lifetime, but I would say that not even your lifetime. So uh, I think it's, it's really far away because now there's no strong AI today. There's no, no computer program. There's no machine that would be aware in any sense. Though they just may look intelligent, but they have no intelligence whatsoever. They are just computer programs. Nothing special about them. Continue. Yeah. Because, I mean, well, don't you think that one of the biggest issues on that question is that we see sentience as a human psychology construct? Uh, we see sentience as a construct of human psychology, as mm. you said. You know, we are modeling AI according to neural networks at the moment. Yeah. So basically, the sentience will not be something we can understand. You know, in a way, by human psychology-based, like you know, assumptions. Yeah, if, if I understood correctly, so uh, of course the human intelligence is the only intelligence that we know, and and uh, by definition a, a machine is intelligent if it behaves like uh, like humans or simulates the human human uh, intelligence. But uh, your question was whether we are actually intelligent uh, either. Well so we understand. I mean, we understand intelligence yeah. by your pre human framework. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. But we, we d actually we don't understand human intelligence and uh, human human consciousness at all. And and a big uh, philosophical question is whether the human brain can understand the human brain. It may be that it's impossible, and that's why there is no progress there. 